So people ask the question, what about their own negativity, their own negative feelings, thoughts, emotions, and beliefs, and how their inner experiences of negativity may affect what it is that they share in the divine matrix. And what the ancient traditions say about this, this experience is, is nothing new. It's the same experience in humanness now that we had 2,500 years ago. And what the ancient traditions in the text say is that our experience is only an experience, not positive, not negative, until we judge our personal experience, until we give it an importance based on our perceptions and our beliefs. And until we do that, it is simply an experience. So, so the question is, why are we judging ourselves and how do we judge ourselves? And the healing comes from allowing us to feel whatever it is that the world gives to us to feel and to acknowledge that feeling and say, hmm, yes, this is a feeling. Sometimes it's a good feeling, sometimes it's a bad feeling, but to allow the feeling to unfold without judging what the feeling means or being afraid of how it may affect something else in the world. The feelings that we call negative are simply indicators, indications that something has crossed our path that now is inviting us to examine this experience. Why do I feel this way? What is it saying to me? And they become a problem only when we ignore them, when they go unresolved, unreconciled feeling is the term that we, that we use. When the feelings are unresolved and we bury uh, or mask our hurt or our frustration or our anger or our jealousy or our rage, and we do that month after month, year after year, and that feeling is buried inside of us looking for an expression, that's where we begin to have the problems. But the feeling itself, when we have a feeling, I have negative feelings, uh, and I don't judge them. I say, hmm, you know, I'm having a feeling about this person uh, or about this situation. And then I have to check with myself and say, why am I having this feeling? What does it mean to me? What is it telling me uh, about my personal beliefs and my personal experience? And in that way, the negative feelings become our best friends because they actually serve us rather than hurt us, and it's all based in our beliefs and the, the, the judgment uh, that we attach to that experience. The ancient Essenes tell us in their texts 2,500 years ago, very precise language, that every human lives in this earth in three worlds at the same time. We live in the world of thought, the world of feeling, and the world of emotion. And their texts actually say to us, when these three become one, when the thought and the feeling and the emotion are merged, are married together into a single potent force, then when you say to the mountain, move, the mountain will move. Now, I used to believe that this was a metaphor, and now I have seen in the monasteries of Tibet, and I've seen with the holy and the sacred people in Bolivia and Peru, in the native traditions of the desert southwest, in the medicineless hospitals in Beijing, China, this is not a metaphor. It is a literal fact. When thought, feeling, and emotion become one, we literally can change the stuff our world is made of. We can rearrange the atoms of matter through the belief waves that emanate from our heart. So the question is, when we are experiencing judgment in ego, what is that saying to us really? Well, the first thing it's telling us is that we are not in our heart because the heart has no judgment and the heart has no ego. When we are experiencing those, those qualities, uh, it is coming from our mind. It's coming from our inner child. It's coming from our fear, from our families, our perceptions, our conditioning. It's not coming from our heart. And this is so interesting to me because I, uh, I'm using the English language now. And in the English language, uh, it, the language is not designed for this conversation. Other languages are Sanskrit. For example, ancient Sanskrit. Uh, in Sanskrit, there is one word that means the energy body of the human, for example. It is prana. Um, in English, there is no single word for prana. So we have to take other words, put them together, uh, 
uh, energy body or uh, electrical magnetic field or something like that. And the same is true when we speak about the language of the heart. There is no word in the English language that describes the language of the heart. Part of my heritage is southeastern Cherokee, Native American Cherokee. And in that tradition, there is a word that means the single eye of the heart, the heart that doesn't see right and wrong and good and bad. It simply sees what has happened with no judgment. And that word is shante ishta, shante ishta, the single eye of the heart. And so the goal of many ancient traditions, early Christian, early Jewish, early Buddhist, Native American, uh, and now the scientific principles today, is to find a way to view the experiences of life, what happens in the world around us, our relationships, our finances, uh, our health, through the single eye of the heart, the eye that says, yes, this is what has happened, without saying, what has happened is good or bad or right or wrong. And when we find ourselves having those experiences, we are in our mind. And, and it is the marriage of the mind and the heart that give us the power to create. And the way they say to transcend, to get through the judgment uh, that we find ourselves in, uh, it sounds strange at first. But what they invite us to do is this. When something hurts us in life, when something crosses our path that causes us pain, our first reaction is to move away from it, to say, I don't want that. And that is when the judgment comes in. If we can embrace the experiences when someone or an experience hurts us in life, not that we like the experience or we want to have it again, but the ancients say that we should bless the experience. And this sounds very strange, to bless the things that hurt you. But here's what happens. When we begin to bless the things that cause us the pain, the blessing is simply the acknowledgement. When you say, I bless the person who, uh, who has just been dishonest with me. Uh, I bless the person who has um, violated my trust, betrayed my confidence. And you say that again and again, and you say it out loud. What begins to happen is... The verbal expression brings the physical energy up from the heart into the body. And soon your body becomes warm and you have tears in your eyes. And you say, I bless this person, I bless this person. And it is the blessing that relieves the charge of the judgment for just a moment. And that's all we need. Because for just a moment, when the charge is relieved, we can replace the hurt with something else. And the ancients say that that something else is what we call beauty. Beauty is a powerful force in our world. And it already exists everywhere. The ancient Essenes and the Native Americans alike. They say that beauty is already everywhere in everything. Our job is to find that beauty, to seek it out. Now, Mother Teresa was a master at this. She would walk down the streets of Calcutta, India. And she would see dead bodies on the street and decay in the gutters. And in the, the dung in the gutter of the streets in Calcutta, she would find a flower growing. And in that flower, she would find beauty in the streets. And that experience allowed her the strength to find even more beauty in life. So rather than judging the experiences, when they come to us, if we can look at each experience as a blessing... And when we find ourselves hurt, say, again, yes, I feel hurt. So acknowledge it first. Secondly, what is this hurt saying to me? What voice am I hearing? What does it tell me about my life? And bless the hurt now that is giving us information about ourselves. As we begin that experience, it is much easier then for our thoughts, feelings, and emotions to become one so that we can move that mountain when it comes across our paths. So the question then that the scientist asks is if we know the experiences work, if we know that when one person or a group of people come together and they share a common experience in their heart for a period of time, such as the International Peace Project in the Middle East, 
where people came together to feel the feelings of peace during the Lebanese-Israeli war in the early 1980s. During the time they created those feelings, statistically, terrorist activities dropped to zero. Crimes against people declined. The emergency hospital room visits declined. Traffic accidents declined. And so the scientists ask, if this prayer is so powerful, then why didn't it last? And this is the crux, the secret of the ancient traditions that has been missed by so many people today. Because this experience in our heart was viewed by the scientist as something you do for a moment in time. So you go about your daily life and at a certain time you stop your daily life and you do this heart experience, this prayer, and when the prayer is over you stop the prayer and go back to your life. And the crux of our most cherished, sacred and ancient traditions is very clear that this experience of the heart is not something that we do, it is something that we become. It is something that we live in our lives. Life becomes the prayer. Every moment of every day is the prayer. And because this modality of prayer, it's called the lost mode of prayer, feeling-based prayer, because the prayer is based in a feeling, and we can have a feeling all the time. We can have a feeling in our cars driving on the, the highway. We can have a feeling in the office, in the school, with our families, uh, alone in the park. We can always have a feeling, and that means we can always be in prayer. But it's not something that we do in a moment. It's a way of living. It's a way of life. It's something that we become. And when we do that, the prayer never ends. And that is the secret to maintaining the powerful effects that are documented by science and, uh, and that the ancient texts uh, and the Essenes tell us are possible in our lives. Absolutely. The, the, the whole idea, uh, and the, the abbot in Tibet was so very clear when he said this, the, the new abbot. And I asked him the question through the translator. I said, what is the force that holds the universe together? We had already had the conversation that there is something out there. So I was asking for specifics from his, uh, his Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist perspective. I said, what is it that holds the universe together? What connects everything in the universe? And he had a conversation with the translator, and then he answered me with one word. He said, compassion. And I said, well, wait a minute. Uh, I thought that compassion is a feeling, an experience that we have in our bodies, in our hearts. I'm asking you, what is the force that holds everything together? And he answered me again. He said, compassion. And I said, well, is it, is it an experience or is it a force? And he said, yes, it is both. And to me, that is so powerful because it reminds us that we are born into this world with a power uh, in our hearts uh, that we already have, that we don't have to learn, it's already there, uh, and it's a power that aligns us with the, the framework, with the matrix of the universe itself, as Max Planck uh, called this field of energy, the matrix, in 1944. He coined the term, the matrix, uh, to describe this, this network of energy that holds particles of the universe together. And, and from the Buddhist perspective, uh, the Tibetan Buddhist perspective, they recognize that the experience of compassion, it's not just feeling sorry for someone or saying, oh, poor person, you know, they're having a bad day. In West, Western traditions, sometimes people think of compassion as that way. And that may be a part of it. But from the Buddhist perspective, it, it's much deeper than that. It is living life uh, awake and conscious and present in our hearts in the moment knowing that we are part of all that is and that what we do every moment of life is affecting not only us it's affecting the other side of the universe and consciously living our lives uh, respecting and honoring that relationship and it's such a beautiful way to live now that scientists have been able to show us through the imagery of the Chandra X-ray Space Observatory. The mission of this observatory was to detect invisible fields of energy in the universe. So while scientists have always suspected uh, that up to 90% of the universe, uh, is, they say, is empty, 
And this observatory now is showing us that in the space that we once believed was empty, it's not empty. There's a lot of energy in there, and it looks like a web or a net of energy. Uh, and it is the compassion in our hearts that creates the waves, the belief waves of electrical and magnetic energy that align us with this, with this field. This is our technical, Western, male-dominated, schematically oriented, scientific way of describing, and it sounds very complex. The Buddhist monk, the abbot, he says, compassion, and he says the same thing. Uh, and they have always known this. And this is where it, it's so fascinating to me because science is a language. And it is only one language that describes our world and our relationship to the world. There are other languages. And science is a relatively new language. It's only about 400 years old. Other languages are 7,000 years old in the case of the Vedas. So science is good, however, it, it's incomplete. And we know that science does not have all of the complete answers. So when we go into the other traditions, to, to see how they describe our relationship to the universe, in some ways they're, they're much more complete. So Western science now, modern science, is only arriving in the last years of the 20th century and, and early 21st century. They have just arrived at the understanding that the field is out there, and they're saying, what do we do with this field? On the one hand, and on the other hand, this is the place where the ancient traditions have always begun. Science has spent 400 years debating and trying to prove whether or not everything is connected, while these ancient traditions began with the understanding that, of course, everything is connected. They didn't spend 400 years proving the connection. Their 400 years was used exploring how we may use that connection to become better people and create a better world. And, and for me, as a scientist, this is the value of looking into our most ancient and cherished traditions, honoring our past. Don't throw it out the window, honor it. And marry that wisdom with the best science of today. And together they create a greater wisdom than either would give us individually. And I think that we need that wisdom now at this time in history to solve the problems that we see in our lives. Science tells us how things work. The ancient traditions tell us how to apply that understanding in our life. Science told us that we must believe either one or the other, science or spirituality, but not both. Now, as a child, I always believed that science and spirituality are the same thing. And I thought everybody else believed the same thing. They just didn't talk about it. So I always believed that when we study science, we understand nature and how the world works. Ultimately, we're understanding God. But when I began working in the corporations, I found nothing could be further from the truth. They said, you either are a scientist or you're a spiritualist. You either use technology or you use religion. And uh, it doesn't have to be that way. So I think our greatest power in this civilization, there is a new science and a new spirituality that's being born right now. And it's so new it doesn't even have a name. We don't know what we'll call it. And maybe it's better with no name, because if there's a name, then there's rules and somebody owns it. So right now it has no name. But it is a blending, a beautiful marriage of the technology and science that we have today uh, with the understandings that have served us for over 5,000 years and, and got us to the point where we are today. If I had the opportunity, if I came to this world from another world and I could ask one question of myself in this lifetime based on what I knew here that I couldn't find in that other world, I would ask the question, what is the one thing that we have in this world that would wake us up and remind us that we're a family and that we are more than the differences that have separated us in the past and that we're too precious 
to kill ourselves in war, what is the one thing that could be awakened in this lifetime and shared with every human on the face of the earth that would remind them of that truth? Because I believe it is a truth. That's what I would ask. The word resonance is a, it's a very powerful word in our language uh, that simply means when two energies find a way to match one another. So for example, uh, I'm a guitarist, so I'll use a guitar as an example. If I have two guitars in the same room, and I have one guitar leaning against one wall, and another guitar against another wall, and I take one string and pluck the string here, this string on the other guitar will begin to vibrate as if it were the one that were touched. And the reason is because they are in resonance. They are tuned the same. The other strings will not vibrate because they're not tuned the same. This is a powerful principle because we can find resonance in our heart. We tune our bodies the way we tune a musical instrument. And we do this with thought, feeling, emotion, and belief. We choose the quality of belief inside of our bodies that brings us into resonance with the truth and the beauty or the anger uh, and the hate of the world around us. And the beauty is that we get to choose where that resonance comes from. The principle of resonance is perhaps one of the most powerful principles in nature because it allows tremendous change to happen very quickly uh, with a very few people uh, in, in the kinds of things that we're talking about now. And the reason is because if those few people learn the language of resonance with the divine matrix, with the field, if they choose peace and healing uh, in their bodies, and they find that they can convey that in the divine matrix, the focused power of knowing the language is stronger than the chaotic power of not understanding the language. So many people in chaos is what we see in our cities right now. A very few people focused that understand the language may transcend. I'm not going to say that they overpower or that they win. I'll say that they transcend. They're no longer locked into the negativity from those other people. And it's because of the principle of resonance. In our live programs, uh, I often share a, a video, a very rare, uh, beautiful, uh, precious film uh, that shows the healing of a woman from a cancerous tumor that is performed in the medicineless hospital in Beijing, China. And through the, the technology of sonogram, of ultrasound, we can see inside of her body, we can see a cancerous condition uh, change in less than three minutes in the presence of three practitioners who understand the language of resonance that her body recognizes. So when they create the feelings within their hearts of her healing, her body mirrors that healing back to them. And I share this video for one reason and one reason alone. Because when we have the conversation in the workshop, it is academic, it's theory, it's nice to think about and we hope it's true. When we see the image of the healing, it takes the whole conversation out of possibility and makes it very real in our lives. And we say that one of two things has just happened. Either we saw the video and it is a fake, because you can fake on a computer. Or we saw the video and we have just seen something with our eyes that our heart wants to believe and that our mind needs to help us understand that miracles can work. So the reason I share the video is because it is quick, potent, powerful, the image, we'll think about that image for a long, long time to show people that it is real. However, they don't need to go to that precise hospital or any hospital to have that experience because the whole idea of showing the video is to show that when we can feel these feelings in our bodies, we affect 
our own healing. And I'll tell you how I know this, because I've had the personal experience. In my life, uh, I was diagnosed with a condition in the year 2000. Uh, and I went to a traditional doctor, and they did traditional techniques and said, there's something there that shouldn't be there in your body. And I had to think about that. And I said, hmm, I travel the world and I show people this possibility from theory. And now I'm having an experience. What would this mean to me? And I realized it was an opportunity for me to practice and trust within myself what I'd been showing so many other people. So that from that moment forward, I could look at any human in the eye and I could say to them, I know you have this power. And I can say this to you with confidence because I have healed myself doing exactly what I'm sharing with you right now. And that's what happened. I used the techniques that I learned in the monasteries in Tibet and I learned from the healers in China. However, I still went through the medical procedure because there's the part of the mind that questions. So I underwent the anesthetic, the doctors began to explore, and I woke up in the recovery room and the doctor said, what are you doing here? There is nothing there. There was never anything there. There was no scar tissue. There was no evidence. He said, why are you here? And, uh, and I began in my uh, waking up state to tell him about the power of human emotion to heal our bodies. And that's something that doctors don't like to hear. <laughs> However, I have shown this video not only to public groups, such as the ones in Milan and um, in Germany and France and England. I've shown them to private organizations, the United States Air Force medical facilities. I've shown them to uh, medical conventions and medical doctors. Uh, and, and they will look at this as a isolated miracle. They say, yes, this has probably happened. It's a miracle. We'll come back and explore it later, but first we're going to find the cure for cancer because in their mind, there's a disconnect. In, in the mind of a modern medical practitioner, there is no relationship between heart waves, belief waves, electromagnetic fields in the heart in the healing of the body. In their mind, there is the model that you must either use chemicals or drugs or physically remove or alter the body in some way to affect the healing. Uh, and, uh, and I think this is changing. It's changing now. But whether it changes in the world or not, what I know is that I can go into any audience with any person on the face of this earth and I can look them right into the eye and I can tell them I know this is true and I know it because of my personal experience. When we say the practice for many people in the West, again, it sounds like something that we do sometimes. And the key to all of the traditions is that it becomes a way of life rather than something that we do sometimes. Our conditioning in the West is that our spiritual practice is something that we do at the end of the day when the children are fed and the bills are paid and the dishes are done and the clothes are clean and the lunches are prepared for the next day and then we go into a room and close the door and turn on the music and light the incense and burn a candle and by then it's two o'clock in the morning and we're too tired to do anything and we take a deep breath and say a mantra and go to bed. <laughs> the point is, and that's an exaggeration, but uh, for many people the point is that their spiritual practice is compressed into a few moments after everything else is finished in our culture ours being the West. However, you go into the Native American cultures in North America, South America, uh, again into the monasteries in Egypt and Tibet, their entire lives are the spiritual practice. And then every once in a while, they will stop that spiritual practice for a moment to, to make change for 20 euros. Uh, it's just the opposite of the way we, we think about life. So, so again, it's about becoming the practice and allowing it to be a way of life rather than viewing it as something that we do uh, in, in a moment in time. And this is, we, we do the programs all over the world and people come after the program, one days, two days, three days, and they say, great program, where is the next program? What should I study next? And I have to say to them, there is no more, go home and 
experience and, and live what it is that you've learned here. But for some people, the, the diversion, they, it's easier to go from workshop to workshop and study to study and teacher to teacher uh, rather than embrace and live what they've learned already in, in their lives. Everyone learns differently, and some people uh, need the support and the structure of a group or a teacher to mentor them through, and other people uh, need only a little, a little push and a reminder of how it works, and they have the discipline to live this on their own, and that's what makes us unique. We're all different. We all learn differently. Uh, we all learn from different language, and that's why there's so many teachers that often teach the same thing. And people come up to me uh, all the time and say, this sounds very similar to what my Buddhist teacher said, or what A Course in Miracles says, or what someone else has said. And I, I say, well, yes, that's good, because I expect if something is true, you will hear it many different times in many different ways. However, while my language may work for some people, other people, they may learn better from another language. And I've learned, our, we do workshops for children. Uh, in second grade, so they're eight and nine years old. And we go into the school, and the school invites us. And when we do that, I use very different language. Very visual programs, no technical words, a lot of direct experience, and we pose it all as a mystery that has not yet been solved. And these young people love to know that there's something left that they can still solve. Uh, I speak to high school seniors. We use a different language, very different language. We've gone into nursing homes where people have a very short attention span uh, and the technical words will not work. So we find another language. So people ask uh, the question uh, frequently, within the divine matrix, uh, is there a master plan? Uh, do I believe that there is a master plan? Um, and there are a number of different ways of, of looking at this. From the perspective of the ancient texts, we are approaching a time in history, a convergence time in history, when our world and our bodies are about to change. And all of the rules that have worked up until this moment in time will change. We will still be here and there will still be a world, but the rules will become different. So from that perspective, the, uh, the owner's manual, if you will, of how we work in this world that has been here for 5,000 years, uh, that divine plan may be coming to an end. We begin another plan. But within this divine matrix, what we know is this. We're living in a field of many possibilities and energy that will allow us to create whatever it is that we can imagine in our minds and feel in our hearts. And from that perspective, we are limited only by our imagination and our courage to feel the feeling in our hearts as if our dreams have already come to pass, if they've already come true. Uh, that, I believe, is what our experience here is all about. What happens if you take uh, a beautiful human with a mind and a heart and you place them into a world where they may create anything that they choose? Will they create lightness or dark? Will they choose peace or will they choose war? Uh, I believe we have complete freedom to create. However, I believe we are limited in the sense that we will not be allowed to destroy this planet uh, because I believe we are also part of a greater existence and what happens here affects life beyond here. And from that perspective, uh, there is a greater plan that allows us to develop and mature, but will not allow us to destroy this world or ourselves. I believe that plan exists. <laughs>